percent of the fossil fuel market that already is in place. And I haven't seen any good. <laughs> I haven't heard any good arguments why it would be impossible for fossil fuels when it's possible for biofuels. I hope this is going to work. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. It, differ, nothing is impossible as far as differentiating. The one thing that makes differentiating among crude oils more difficult than differentiating among biofuels is the way that they're transported. Um, biofuels are typically not transported by pipeline. In the um, in the instance of ethanol, you really can't export it by or can't move it around by pipeline because it's very corrosive. And so there tend to be discrete batches of biofuels that go from here to there, and they're very easy to keep track of. I'm not saying that it's impossible to do for crude oil. Nothing's impossible. But it is much more difficult when you mix things in a refinery, mix things in a pipeline system, to keep track of where specific molecules, specific barrels, specific batches even came from. So it can be done. I'm not saying that it can't. I'm just saying that it, you definitely need more infrastructure, and you need to take that challenge into account. OK, Lorenzo, we need to. Uh, do you want to just make a quick point, and then we'll send the mic up to the? If there's any battery left. Um, I'm no, actually controlling the batteries by remote yeah. control. So if I we should create a market here. <laughs> um, no, actually, um, when you oil, we, we keep, you know, we, we're looking at a donut, and we look at the hole, and, and, and we miss the donut. You know, oil products are taxed in Europe and in most OECD countries to a very, very, very high level, all right? To a level that is way above the social cost of carbon. I mean, you take even an aggressive number like the, 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 the Stern Review, you know, the so social cost of carbon of, of the Stern Review is about, what, 150 euros per tonne. That's the value today of the damage that is going to be done by climate change in you know, many decades. I mean, you can trust this number or not trust it, but it's, and, and it's much higher than what other economists came, with, came up with. We tax oil at a level that is way above that. So the idea that Europe, which is a very marginal, if not negligible, importer of tar sands, but also a, a, a small and diminishing part of the oil market is going to make any difference to anything by putting a different value, default value to, to Tarsan as opposed to Saudi Arabian crude. I mean, let's face it, it's just bad policy. Okay. Um, Lorenzo, if you could whisk the... Oh, yeah, that works, okay. Um, I'm Philip Owen from the European Commission. I feel I should make a few observations on the two points raised this evening. Um, first of all, thank you to the panel for all your input. I've seen some of this before. I've heard some of it before, but it's good to hear it again. If you say it often enough, maybe we'll get the message sooner or later. Okay, a few, a few facts. First of all, we commissioned um, a series of reports um, to establish default values for oil sands and oil shales. These were published at the end of January. Since then, we've had them peer reviewed. We've had a stakeholders uh, event uh, to hear stakeholders' views on that. And again, we've put these reports back online last night uh, together with the peer review, third peer review response. So I think, you know, we're being very transparent. don't disagree on a number of things. First of all, that there is overlaps between crude oil and oil sands. And at the margins, you will find some crude oils, like Nigerian, for example, which are higher levels, which 
will overlap partly with, with oil sands, but they are different feedstocks, and that is our point here, and that is why we're following this approach, which differentiates these, these different forms uh, of feedstock. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that we're looking at averages. The default values which we'll use for crude oil um, in our implementing act come from a joint the JEC, that's the uh, consortium which put together the well to wheels work on behalf of the European Union. The oil industry is part of that. And I really hope the data they're using to come up with their, their values it is, is verifiable. Um, I guess it is. So I guess that they, the oil industry does have values for Russia and all these other countries which we which Samantha seems to be a bit skeptical about. So, you know, I'm trusting the European oil industry here. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong in that, uh, but uh, I hope I'm not. So, we're coming up with an average, and that is why when you look at these individuals, these individual different values, when you come to the average of what is being consumed in the EU, that is the value we need. Not one specific one, but an average. And the same for oil sand. We will take the average of oil sand values and uh, come up with one value which is employed to oil, applied to oil sand, whether they come from Venezuela, whether they come from Canada, or whether they come from Europe. Thank you. Okay. Would any of the panelists like to come back on any of the points? Oh, only very briefly. The one thing that I would comment on is the idea that oil sands are not crude oil. They, they are definitely... They are produced in a slightly different way, but they're not the only crude oil that looks like oil sands. Very heavy oils from other places look a lot like oil sands, and they act in a refinery a lot like oil sands. And so when you make that very distinct oil sands distinction, whether it be Canadian, Venezuelan, or anywhere else, that, that distinction is a bit artificial. There are certainly other sources of steam-enhanced crude oil from the Middle East, for instance, this one at the bottom is not included in that in your your discussion however it's produced just like in situ oil sands with steam injection so it's that the, the distinction is, is a bit artificial and it frankly doesn't make a lot of sense to me but actually um i just remain generally perplexed and confused about the feedstock argument um it's one that I've never completely understood. Um, we originally started talking about emissions on this file, then we shifted to somehow a different feedstock. And we would invite the commission to uh, explain to us, uh, I think we've asked in writing uh, in, in past months for, for an explanation of where this feedstock designation is coming from. Um, we be very happy to, to see more information on this because it really is something that, that we, don't, uh, we don't understand, particularly given uh, uh, the fact that, um, that there are other heavy oils out there. We don't see the, the line uh, in the sand, as you will. Um, in terms of, uh, of Elizabeth's question, just with regards to the practicalities of implementing this, um, that's another fuzzy area for us. Um, we know that, for example, on any given day, um, the ratio, what is exported from Canada, for example, will, will not be a discrete crude, as you said. So it's, you're not going to see an oil sands crude from uh, Albion Sands uh, project sent down to um, a, uh, um, a refinery in the United States. What you will see is, for example, something called Western Canadian Select which will be a blend of crudes. It will be crudes from the oil sands, it, could be, it will include crudes from other heavy oils or light oils in Canada. Um, that blend will change, uh, the ratio of that blend will change on any given day, uh, depending on the, um, on the request, essentially, of the refinery. So what is the refinery looking for? What is the, the diet of the refinery? Um, and so that is just one element. In fact, given that the United States imports crudes from all over the world that would also be mixed into the diet of the refinery. So I'm not really sure um, how that refinery would be expected to trace the molecules um, and then um, essentially label them uh, as they cross the ocean, particularly as um, when you sell a crude, uh, you know, it's a, this is a global commodity market. Uh, so once you sell the product, you don't actually know its final destination. That product can be sold at any uh, given time. And, and as a, the Canadian government, um, you know, our 
mandate on this file essentially ends at the border. Um, so actually that's a question that, that maybe uh, the US government um, would be more interested in is exactly how, um, how this would be implemented given the fact that it's physically impossible to, sh to export Cana oil sands crude to the European Union. This is a landlocked um, resource. There is no uh, pipeline to the east coast of Canada. The pipelines go north-south. So the pipelines will go to, south to the United States and that's where any export will come from. So, uh, so yes, that's something that will have to be looked at further, I think. Can I just make a very short point? Sure. Um, Lorenzo? What you're, what you're answering and what you're saying is basically that we're in danger if this proposal is pursued is to develop a secondary market in certificates that will only apply to U.S. exports of petroleum products and not only of petroleum products to the EU because from <coughs> my understanding, once you put refined products on a boat, they may be destined for Latin America but the shipper may decide to change their course to Greece or to the Netherlands or to Belgium or several other places throughout the journey that the, the refined products are taking so that all exports basically of refined products uh, may come in a situation where they need certificates. And what sort of market for potential fraud and what sort of bureaucratic burden is the EU creating for imports of less than 3% of their consumer. Okay. Nusha, you wanted to come back and then we're running out of time, so and uh, we can have some closing remarks, and Nusha. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that all the problems that are being pointed out, we have a precedent. It's the EU biofuels policy. I mean, carbon intensity. She's a disaster. <laughs> I agree to some extent, but oh, still. I mean, the point is, we cannot regulate one little source of fuels and ignore 95% of existing market. We need to get a carbon accounting right for fossil fuels as well. And the truth is that carbon intensity depends on the source of fuel, both bio and fossil, and on the way it's produced, production method. And this should be reflected. And we would really encourage the Commission to go ahead we have the science now, put it in the proposal, in the implementing measures we have been waiting for for quite some time already, and then let's do more studies and let's see production methods and how they affect carbon intensity. Okay, thank you, Nusha. Uh, I'm just gonna give Pierre a quick word just to come back on that, um, and then I, I'm gonna invite the closing remarks. Yeah, briefly, please. See what goes on. very simple proposal, which is to scrap this uh, directive altogether. Um, again, you know, emissions are rising in the transport sector, despite the fact that we tax oil at an astronomically high level. This is a reflection that the marginal cost of reducing emissions in the transport sector is very high compared to everything else. The idea that we should reduce emissions in all sectors is economic nonsense. Of course, we should start by the sectors that are the most, you know, the cheapest to decarbonize. And this is what a carbon tax or a properly designed cap and trade system would do. All right? So we scrap this uh, uh, directive, which is, imp you know, impossible to put in place and, and, um, and would not change anything to global or, or EU emissions. And we continue to do what we've been doing quite successfully, sorry which is to uh, improve the fuel efficiency of cars. Uh, you know, the idea that by, you know, if we really want to reduce in transport, the idea that we should do both efficiency and fuel in uh, carbon intensity of fuels, again, is economic nonsense. There must be one of the two that is most cost effective, and we should you know, do that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'd now like to invite um, John Abbott, Senior Vice President of Shell Heavy Oil, to, Heavy Oil, to make some concluding remarks and I just to let you know there is a, a reception afterwards so please don't rush away
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon, and thank you for uh, inviting me to make these uh, closing remarks. As Simon said, my name is John Abbott. I am the uh, Executive Vice President of uh, Shell's heavy oil business. I am based in uh, Calgary in Alberta, and uh, my accountabilities include uh, uh, oil sands mining business, which I run there for Shell, but also the in situ operations. And uh, I must admit I found the debate this evening uh, both insightful and quite stimulating. Hopefully, being a European who operates uh, oil sands facilities, um, it gives me that balance to uh, conclude in these remarks. And I'll say a little bit about myself and uh, what Shell is doing, but I'd also like to take my perspective on what I have heard this evening, because that's how I personally learn. So, I am aware of what it takes to develop these resources and the steps that we in Shell are taking to improve our performance. Both business performance, but most importantly, environmental performance. And I'm passionate about the way that we interact with our local communities, the First Nations and Aboriginals. I haven't been much discussion about that this evening, but I see that an important part of my particular job. And there's no doubt in the last couple of years um, since I've been in this role, and prior to that I was in Houston in the refining business, so I know what's happening as well in the refining business in the US. I've had an opportunity to engage many people on the oil sands, whether it be government, stakeholders in terms of Aboriginals, NGOs, uh, but also our investors and shareholders. And uh, I must admit that um, I do find it very helpful to hear these different perspectives. There is no doubt that development of any energy source causes impacts. And I believe our job, and I believe my job, as a company is, is to help to meet our energy needs, but also to develop the resource in the most environmentally and socially acceptable manner. And in the future, I firmly believe that the sustainability of the heavy oil business and the oil sands business will not only depend upon our ability to compete on the bottom line and satisfy our investors in that respect, but also to keep raising the standard of the non-technical risk areas, and by that I mean the environmental impacts. So actually in Shell, as we go forward, we are excited about the growth possibilities that we have in the oil sands. But we do recognize that that growth needs to be coupled with improvement in our environmental management. And to that end, I am personally within Shell developing environmental strategies to reduce our greenhouse gases, to reduce the amount of water that we use, and also to minimize our impact on the land and ensure that the, uh, uh, the renovation of that land and the reclamation of that land takes place as quickly and as responsibly as we know how. That is my personal job. So what did I hear this evening? Let me try and summarize, which is probably quite difficult of the, uh, the range of views that we heard, but let me try. Firstly, I heard a little bit of context setting in that Europe is a shrinking part of the global crude demand, and the growth in crude demand is outside of Europe. And with an increasing energy demand outside of Europe, the crudes that are not consumed in Europe will be consumed elsewhere. That's just a supply-demand balance, and that's the message I heard. I also heard that oil sands currently provides about 2% of the global crude supply, perhaps increasing to about 4% in the 2020-2030 period. There was also then, around those numbers, a discussion of the significance of the emissions from oil sands, but there was a total agreement that irrespective of these small percentages, there is a need to work on reducing CO2 emissions from all of our operations, especially in the transport fuel sector. What did I also hear in terms of Europe? I heard that the high carbon intensity fuels are not welcome here in Europe. And that the EU wants to incentivize low carbon investments. But we also saw that oil sands is not off the scale in terms of carbon intensity, 
Yes, it is higher than the European average, but it is not off the scale. Also, we heard that there are a number of crudes that have an equal, if not higher, carbon intensity than oil sands derived products and oil sands crudes. And many of those crudes are entering Europe today. There was some disagreement on how much we know about the carbon intensity of some of those crudes coming from the likes of Algeria and Nigeria and Russia. And yes, there is data out there, but to what extent does that data represent the flaring that goes on in some of those facilities? But we also heard the message that no, we're not just singling out oil sands. The data is there today, but in summary, there is still a remaining nagging doubt about the quality of some of that data. We then heard from the Commission that they had uh, indeed commissioned a number of external reports, uh, which they had been quite transparent about publishing, but they did acknowledge overlaps in data in terms of the carbon intensity of some oil sands crudes and other more conventional crudes. We also then heard a different topic being, on the, being brought on the table, that is oil sands a different feedstock? And that was clearly contested, and it is clearly an issue that needs to be resolved as to whether oil sands is or is not a different feedstock. We heard Canada is in full agreement with the intent and objectives of the Fuels Quality Directive. But we also heard separately there are frustrations around the speed of implementation of that policy due to lobbying. And the question was asked, why, why are we lobbying? The point was made that um, Europe also set something of a global standard in policy setting. And it is an important example to the world. And I think that was one of the reasons why we have to get this decision making right. We then heard a comparison of what the EU is proposing with respect to the Californian low carbon fuel standard, where indeed there are limits set on carbon intensity, but not specifically singling out individual crudes. And um, there was also then a question around the practicalities of implementing some of the proposed legislation when crude leaving Canada mainly leaves that landlocked country via pipelines and where there is mixing of the crudes within those pipelines and ultimately resulting up to 4,000 barrels a day of exports from the United States across to the EU, predominantly in the form of diesel. So in summary, I would say yes, there is a commitment from everyone and from all sides to reduce CO2 emissions. But I also heard a commitment that any decision that is taken will be founded on science. And um, there are still those questions around quality of data and the questions of is it a different feedstock, yes or no, that truly need to be bottomed out. But I also heard the message that there will not be specific discrimination or singling out of oil sands. But coming back to the industry perspective, can we do better? Yes, of course we can do better. The oil sands industry is actually still a very young industry. And Shell indeed didn't start its operations there until 2003. And we can always do better and Shell is a company that has a track record of continuous improvement, applying technology and innovation to find solutions to some of these energy challenges. And an example is our plans and our proposal to put the first carbon capture and storage facility on our oil sands um, equipment and facilities within Alberta, very much supported by the Alberta and the federal government. And so I very much welcome the debate I very much enjoyed the debate, and my personal commitment is that I and Shell will continue to work on improving our performance as we develop these important energy resources. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today, and I'm quite happy to take any questions 
or discuss any of the aspects that I have raised in my summary uh, at the reception immediately following this event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'd just, just like to thank all the panellists and you for attending. Just to point out a couple of things just in closing. There are feedback forms. You should find them on your seats. Uh, please encourage you to fill them out. It helps us improve the quality of our events. As I mentioned, there's a cocktail reception, which I think should be on the terrace if it hasn't started raining uh, in between. Uh, and there's a comment vision stand uh, where you can uh, look at the debate and you can make your own contributions and indeed uh, afterwards at uh, commentvisions.com. Uh, I'd like to thank you.